Ah, uh, there's a good part of probability. Because, like I said, these guys, they're always asking things that they've asked in the textbook. Just slightly different, shorter. So, when it comes to uh, 2B, your past tests are very, very good in preparing you for the exam. Preparing you for the exam. So, even like if you don't have the time to go through all of them, at least go and see the questions so you know, okay, this is how they ask, this is how they ask, and then you know, okay, this is how I need to answer at least. Or this one I need to prepare to be able to. Okay, so if we do the, the past three parts, yeah. So how are we gonna know if the answers are correct or not? What is going to be so Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a challenge that we have every every year uh, across the board with all our modules. Um, but what I can say is the best way to go about that is to actually go with your textbook when doing the the past papers to say, okay, look for a similar question to what they're asking there, and then say, okay, how have they answered it? So forth, so forth, and then try to match that when answering it. So you're gonna basically have to prepare your own memos in a sense. Is, is it typical? Is it? Yeah, it's written on campus, huh? Yeah. It's written on campus. Yeah. Yeah, but I think learning unit two is actually is actually the one of the most challenging bits, just in terms of wrapping your head around it. But once you get it, you get it. Let me have a look at the table of contents and see what the Oh, probably, yeah, decision trees, learning in a six. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's a bit tricky for you guys. And what my assumption was that you guys just didn't get through it the first time, not that you were seeing it for the first time, you know? So that is even worse, because at least then, if you had had some prior knowledge on it, then it's like, ah, okay, you just need to polish up on this, polish up on that, and then we're home and dry. You see what I was telling you? So these are the formulas that I wrote up. Oh, and you see, I took budgets at first. You took off both sides, huh? It's, it's yeah, yeah. Both sides. Yeah, I think just start over. Uh, you're saying what? You think he's going to need them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh,
Okay, cool. All right, so when it, when it comes to learning unit two, it's really just about um, uh, classification and cost behavior estimation. And, but so what we are really trying to do there is establish uh, variable cost and fixed cost. And sometimes what you get is you get mixed costs. We spoke about this yesterday and it's there in the slide, so don't worry about that. You'll see it there in the slide. Fixed cost is where you have a variable portion and a fixed portion in that cost. So for example, you'll find uh, when it comes to your telephone bill, you know that telecom will give you that fixed, just for having the line, you get a fixed cost. Then based on how many calls you actually make on your landline, that's the variable portion, you see. So now the high-low method is basically how you can distinguish what the fixed portion is and what the variable portion is, okay? It's a very simple uh, uh, formula, okay? But that's what you're doing. You're just trying to establish what's the fixed portion of my cost and what's the variable portion of my cost. So the formula is, 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 is like this. You simply, they're gonna give you two costs. They're gonna tell you, um, they're gonna give you the high cost and they'll give you a lower cost, okay? And then they'll tell you, let's see, the high cost, right? They'll give you a certain level of activity at that high cost. And then the, uh, the low cost, they'll also give you a certain level of activity. Now your job, in order to get the variable cost per unit, you're going to minus the very high cost from the very low cost, or the lowest, actually the lowest cost, right? Then the highest number of units, right, which obviously results in that high cost, minus the lowest activity in units, which results in that low cost, okay? Then when you divide the two, you get your variable cost per unit, okay? To get the fixed cost, you will simply say your highest activity cost, all right, then times your variable cost per unit, right, times the high a number of units, all right, then you'll know, okay, that's, that's, the, that's how I got the fixed cost. Because fixed cost, with it, you can even use the low in order to get the fixed cost. Because you know fixed cost is going to be the same throughout, all right, regardless of how many units we actually produce. But what's important is if you're going to use the low cost, you have to also use the low, low number of units. You have to be consistent in that regard. Does that make sense? If you're going to use the high, you have to make sure you're using the high number of units. High cost. That's all. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can ignore this formula over here. Then you've got the linear regression method. Okay, guys. No, no, I just meant in terms of, ignore that formula in terms of uh, high-low method. High-low method, just use this formula. Also, these, these will give you the same answer. Yeah, these will give you the same answer. Oh, is the, the high-low one this one? No. This formula is in relation to what's coming here, linear regression. Yeah. Uh, what, what they're saying, well, basically here, um, when you look at it, Y is your total cost, right? But you know that within your total cost, you've got a fixed portion and a variable portion. So it's just now explaining that within the formula. So then what we are saying is, okay, A is your fixed portion, and then B is then your variable cost. But then the variable cost cannot stand on its own. It's dependent on how many units you actually produce. So this formula, it is connected to that, but it's just speaking to, okay, now if they tell you, okay, because well now we know our fixed portion and we know our variable portion or our variable cost per unit. Now they might tell you, okay, after calculating this thing, your fixed portion and your variable portion using the high low method, they'll say, how much will it cost us to produce 500 units of this product? Does it make sense? then you can actually work it out using this one. All right, so it's more of a thing of if there's like a follow-up type question. I'm sure you guys have seen this formula before, like when doing lines and maths and stuff like that.
yeah, you see it somewhere. So that's typically how you use it. But I think once you, you don't even need to know this formula when they now tell you how much would it cost to do 500 units because it's just, okay, what's my fixed portion? I know it's going to remain the same. Then my variable cost times the 500 units and you add those two together and you have your total cost. Makes sense? Okay. So now when it comes to linear regression, you're doing the same thing. This is just a different formula. Uh, but now, obviously, sometimes you, you, you can't always use high-low. You can't always use high-low. So when it comes to linear regression, what they're going to do is they'll give you a lot of information in terms of lots of data points. You then are supposed to insert those data points into your calculator. So you guys, you have Casio's. Oh, this is good. So these are the Casio's that uh, are with the videos. You see, I put two video links here. So then what you need to do is obviously then just play around with your calculators using, you can go through example, I think it's example one in your textbooks where they use the regression model. Let me see, example 2.1 maybe, 2.3. You have, no, not for high low, for the regression. Linear square regression, yeah, it's 2.3, you're right. Can you see, this is the data points that I was talking about. All right, you have um, labor hours and you have uh, maintenance costs, various data points, then you've got the total. Okay. Now, what they want you to do is to calculate A and B. In other words, calculate your fixed cost, which is A, and calculate your variable cost, which is B, okay? So in this, in this video, they'll tell you how to insert these data points into your calculator. Once you've inserted these data points, all you're going to do is then you're going to then um, go, uh, what are they, what is it going to calculate? Because ultimately you're looking for A and B. So you're gonna go alpha, and then pick A and then alpha B. But they're going to show you, they're going to show you exactly how to do it in there. So, yeah, just follow those links and then play around with those. Because when you get to the test or exam, obviously you want to be able to do that. Okay. But yeah, don't bother trying to do it this textbook route because you can see that formula is now just a mess. Okay. And you are allowed to obviously go in with your calculator, so just save yourself that trouble. Okay. Then they might also ask you to calculate R squared, okay? R squared, you're just assessing the strength of the relationship between the variables, okay? Um, okay, they have also included another, another video there. Um, and then, yeah, these, you can see I didn't include any videos for these, because literally all they've done in the past is just asked about the definition. Okay, so just know the definition there. Then here, the final thing that we want to touch on today is your learning curve rate calculation. Okay. So this is another one that guys, you need to go and actually practice. Okay, and we were speaking about the learning curve. Let's quickly recap. Learning curve, we're saying, It's an assessment of experience and efficiency. So what's happening is we're saying, I've just begun a job. Let's say I'm in the business of sewing shoes, right? Sewing shoes. So the first day that I get into the factory and I'm sewing those shoes, it's going to take me time to master that craft. But two months from then, it could take me half the time that it took me on the first day. Does that make sense? So that's that now us measuring the efficiency, okay? So what we're then saying when it comes to the learning rate is we want to assess um, that rate at which we are getting more and more efficient. Does it make sense? And then also another thing to highlight whilst we're on that uh, topic, 
when it comes to the learning, it's not like I'm going to keep on getting more and more efficient. Eventually, I'm going to get to a point where I can't get any faster. Does that make sense? Where we can't experience any more additional efficiency. So to calculate that learning rate, you have to say double production level of the average time divided by the initial production level of the average time. Okay, so here, if you look at that table, right, we're saying one unit takes the total production time, let's just say that's three hours. Okay? So the average time for one unit is three. Does it make sense? One, uh, three divided by one gives you three hours. Then for two units, we see we managed to do it in five hours. So the average time for two units is two and a half hours. Okay? Right. So that's the average time for each of those two units that was produced. And I want to make that clear. Not the total time for the two units, but the average time for those two units. So we're saying now double production time, uh, production level, all right, average time. So we're saying 2.5, okay? Because obviously one unit, double one unit is two. Does that make sense? So two and a half hours divided by three hours, our learning rate is then 0.83. Does that make sense? So we now have our learning rate. So sometimes they can ask you just to calculate the learning rate. So this is like 0.82. Exactly. 100%. 100%. Okay. Uh, the exponential function used to calculate the average time to produce a certain number of units. So now we're saying we want to learn how to use that learning uh, function or learning curve rate to assess how long would it take us to produce so many units. Does that make sense? Okay. So then what we say is average time for one unit times the learning rate to the, uh, to the power of. Okay. That's the formula. Now here we go through these illustrations before you then you go into your textbook and start practicing. So here, can you see now, we're looking at how many units. Let's say we want to produce 32 units, okay? We know that the average time for one unit is three, yeah? Based on what we were playing around with at first. So we know that the average time for one unit is three. Then we're saying, we know that our learning rate we calculated it earlier, is that 0 0.83. Then we're saying to the power of 5. Let me zoom in here, sorry. Why are we saying to the power of 5, though? Huh? Remember, we can only operate in doubles. Okay? So, when we say 2 to the power of 5, what do you get? Punch it in your calculator. Two to the power of five. Right. So we're saying two times two, which is four, times two, which is six. Let's play the rules. Sorry, two, two times two, two is four, times two is eight. Sorry, two to the power of five. To the power of five, we get thirty-two. We can only move in doubles. Does it make sense? So every time we move in doubles. So every time. So can you see? So it's going to be 6 before, it's going to be the power of 6. Exactly. Can you see that? If we're going to go 100 and, uh, 128, we move to the power 7. Does it make sense? So here, if we look from here, the calculation, we know the average time is 3 hours, so then the total production time is going to be, because it's 1 unit. Okay, so, so the next one is, I mean, even though we're supposed to figure it out ourselves. You're supposed to figure this out yourself. Yeah. But it's easy when you know the, 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 the formula. Because it's just it's the same throughout. It's the same throughout. Can you see? The only thing that has changed is the power. But otherwise, the average time remains the same. The average time for one unit times the learning curve rate, then to the power of the exponential. Does that make sense? And then now you're getting the average time per unit 
And then can you see now, all we do is we say the number of units times the average time per unit. 432 units. Does that make sense? And that's how we're now getting the total production time of 38.58. Again, now we can even go here to eight units. What is the exponential for eight units? We're saying two times two is four times two. So the exponential is three. Okay? So yeah, that can be a bit of a drag. Trying to just work out what is the Nah, but you'll have your calculator on you. So you can even experiment to get to it. Does that make sense? So it's supposed to be the same with GCD now, two times two. But if I were you, I wouldn't even yeah, you could do it that way. You could do it that way. What I would do, because you know when you say equal, already you forget how many twos you so I would actually go, I'll play around with it, say two to the power two as equal. Two to the power four what is equal. Then I begin to see, okay, roughly, where am I at? Okay, 2 to the power 5. Okay, that's going to give me the 32 that I'm looking for. Makes sense. So that's how we can do our calculation. The, the whole learning curve thing is for this purpose, to, to, to see how long will it take me to produce this number of units. Does that make sense? Okay. And acknowledging that we get faster with time and experience. Yes. I don't know what you call that thing in the calculator. Oh, the square root. Yeah, the square root. So if you just type in, like, let's say 16. Yeah. Square root, or square root 16. Uh huh. The value is exactly what power. Oh, is it? Just a little. I'm hearing what you're saying. No, no. So that's how you get the exponential. That was going to say. Instead of trying to guess, like, okay. What is this? Uh, two to the mm. power of five. Two to the power, power of five. Power, yeah. So that goes a long way. That yeah, goes a long way. Then, uh, yeah. Check. Remember, it's going to be two. It gives you 5.1. It doesn't give you five. What does yeah. it give you? 5.1. I want me to shop on the list using four, one more two, but then uh, five. So how do you know this? So <laughs> you yeah, know how do you know this is four? Yeah. Or oh, it's five? Yeah, 5.6 is a hectic one. So you're going to have to experiment at some stage. Yeah, some of them. Yeah. So, da -da 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 -da. oh no, I actually don't advise you go the square root. Yeah, because we're checking too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm for unbeaten numbers that it does some weird. Yeah, you, you know what? I'm now thinking of it mathematically. When you say something is the square root, you're saying what times what will give me 32. So if you times 5.6 times 5.6, it's going to give you that 32. Does that make sense? So that's why I'm saying yeah, it's a bit risky to use that one. It's a bit risky to use that one. Okay, but it can provide at least some level of guidance. And then maybe as you, as you guess along, then... You know. Okay, but we understand what we're doing here now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, then there's another way of calculating the same thing. Okay. And this is through the logarithmic uh, logarithmic function. If you understand it, I do. <laughs> okay. So right here, the formula is as, as such. Total time to produce one unit, okay, the first unit, okay, times the number of units produced times the logarithm, okay. Now, with this one, you have to work out the logarithm first before you can begin to play around with... Hey, my friend, you know some things we just punch in our calculators. We also are not sure what the hell this is actually doing. <laughs> Uh, so here, to get the logarithm, uh, we are saying your two, three, yes, 
They may ask you. They may ask you average time to produce a certain number of units by using logs. Cumulative average time per unit of X units are produced X units per log. B. Okay. So just explaining this formula here, the Y X. Okay, Y X is obviously uh, what we are trying to figure out in terms of the cumulative time to produce the certain number of units. All right, that's what that small X is for. It's saying in relation to the number of units that you're trying to produce. Then here, the big X again is in relation to the number of units that you're trying to produce. A stands for the first unit of output. Okay, so it's that three. Uh, the, the three uh, hours for the first unit, okay? Then X is the number of units, and then B is this number. We have to go log, learning, rate, okay? So log, 0 0.83, because that's the rate we calculated, right? Then divided by log 2, okay? This stays the same. Because remember, we're always working in doubles. Remember, it's always in doubles that we're working when we were talking about the learning rate. Okay. So uh, that's what we're gonna get to now. So this is now the formula that you want to use with the logs. So we are saying the total amount of time to produce the first unit is three hours that we established. Then we say to ourselves how many units are we looking to produce? You guys tell me how many units are we it can be four, can be six, uh, sorry, four, eight, can be 16. Okay, let's work with four. So we put in, so we're saying three hours, all right, times four units that we are trying to put in. But before you do that, my advice is uh, don't punch anything in your calculator. What we first want to do is work out this hmm, logarithm. So to work out the logarithm, remember we said it's zero point, uh, we're gonna say log, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We, yeah, we're going to first say, I'd advise that we first say, uh, we take this 0 0.03, 0 0.822, whatever we calculate, divided by log two, and then times by, by log. Like, like how they've done it here. Log two, that's the formula here. Can you see that's how we calculate uh, the logarithm? You always divide by two. Yes, you always. Always. Because remember, we're working in doubles. So basically, to calculate the, the efficiency rate, you have to divide by two. Basically. Divide by two. Yes. So, so. This is what, what we must do first. This is my advice to you, do this first, which is what you're talking to now. Get B, move this cursor. Get B first, okay? Because once you have this, it's gonna stay the same. It's not gonna change. For any number, if you look here, for any number, it still stays at 0 0.26. Can you see that? 0 0.26, what, what, hey? This thing is requiring me to constantly zoom in. Okay, can you see that, hey? 0 0.26304. The logarithm is going to stay the same. So can you see why I was saying that? This is actually easier when you now know how to actually do the calculation. Because once you have the logarithm, you're just saying, how many units am I looking to produce times the actual time for one unit? And then you get your answer. So you the log Yeah. You, you calculate it. <laughs> you calculate the log when you calculate but let's try it. Let's try it, guys. So go log and then your, your learning rate. Punch that in. Calculate what that is. You've got it. 
Now that you've got that, can you see now you, you, you've done the heavy lifting? Literally all now you're doing is saying, how much time did it take my first unit? Times how many units I would like to produce then to the power of that log rate. So can you see it's easier than the actual exponential thing that we were doing earlier? But you've got to be comfortable with the logarithm calculation. That's it. That's it. It's just practice. Okay? And can you see we arrive at the exact same figures for each of these uh, total production times? It's exactly the same. So can you see we're arriving at the same output that we wanted to arrive at? You see? So I'm just showing you different ways to calculate. If I scroll back up, you'll see. Can you see? 38.58, same times. Okay. So <laughs> if you get stuck and you're like, I remember how to do it exponential, but I forgot how to do it log, calculate it exponential, at least you'll get the answer, mark for the answer, you see? And then maybe you'll miss out on the formula, uh, method marks. So the log two is always log two. Always log two, because we're always moving in doubles. See. So now, this is, I think this is the last bit of it. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. I'm just going to explain here. Okay. It's not the last bit. Okay. The last bit for learning unit two is now, can you see, what have we been doing with this learning uh, rate? We've been using the learning rate to establish how much time is going to take us to produce 16 units. How much time is going to take us to produce 32 units? How much time it would take us to produce 64 units? ETC, ETC. Does that make sense? All we're interested in is how much time will it take to produce this number of units? Why do we want to know how much time it's going to take us to produce a certain number? Is now the question that we ask ourselves. Exactly. So Why do we want to know how much time it's going to produce us, how much time it's going to take us to produce a certain number of units? We want to know how much time, as he said, so that we then now know, okay, if it takes us five hours to produce all these units, then labor costs, when we say five times, 10 rand per labor hour, we know it's going to cost us 50, 50 rand. Okay? That's the whole purpose of why we're doing this. So, the other thing that we are now trying to begin to learn is to say, ah, but hold on. If we check how much time it takes us to produce 16, uh, 16 units, and how much time it takes us to produce uh, 64 units, or, or even here, if I, let me actually read this. How much time it takes us to produce 32 units, and how much time it takes us to produce 64. This is like, just a 200 and something difference. So maybe we should just produce all of these units, okay? As opposed to producing the exact amount that we need. Does it make sense? So those are the things. And then what we want to know is the cost difference. So here they call it the incremental. What do they call it? The incremental cost. Okay. So we want to know what is the difference between producing. 64 units and producing 32 units. Okay. So first things first, uh, it'll take us 223 hours. Um, let's just make it 224 hours to produce the, the, the second 32 units. The first 32 will obviously take us 400. Can you see that's almost like half the time? Okay. Um, then the other thing is now that we have the time, we can even check the cost difference by simply timesing. Okay, this is how much it's going to cost us to to calculate uh, to produce the first 32. This is how much it's going to cost to by saying okay, if it costs us, and I know we've done the calculation here, so let me actually just scroll down and see. Uh, they've done the calculation, so there it is. So here, there's different components. This one we have the overhead, so on the very overhead, we've got the fixed cost, and we've got the direct cost. So it's 
a direct report to Calypso and will be released. So that's the total cost, all right? Mm -hmm. For the initial 32, can you see that? Then if we scroll down, we'll see the same thing, but now for the second 32, okay? So the first 32, it cost us how much? 7,380. The second, it cost us 4,000. So can you see how now we're using this to compare uh, costs? And that's the whole purpose of it. That's the whole purpose of this, to find out the incremental cost saving. Okay. So that's learning unit two. That's the focus of your learning unit two. Now your learning unit three, you might as well go there since it's in the formula sheet, but we haven't yet gone through the slides. Um, this is actually a good learning unit. Uh, here, all that you're doing is you're doing break-even analysis, okay, and uh, they call it what? Cost volume. Cost volume uh, price analysis. CPV ratios. Now, you just need to know these formulas inside out because what they can do is that they'll give you this formula and then ask you to calculate this, but then in order to first get to that next formula, you need to actually use some of the inputs from the other formula and so forth so forth so you need to know this inside out okay uh fixed uh, break even i can tell you now your test your test two you're gonna get break even there's no two ways about it okay uh, contribution per unit we're literally just saying selling price minus the variable cost what are we doing with break even what's the whole point of break even we're trying to establish Exactly. That's it. How many units do you have to sell in order to start making profit or to not make a loss? Yeah. See, that's, all. that's all that we are doing. Okay. Uh, margin of safety. When it comes to margin of safety, we're saying, so if we say we are producing 10,000 units and our break even is 4,000 units, we're saying margin of safety, can you see budgeted volume of sales, 10,000 units. Break even, we said it's 4,000 units. So our margin of safety is that 6,000 units. We can, we can fail to sell 6,000 units short of our target. Okay? We can be 6,000 units short of our target, and we still will not make a loss. That's our margin of safety. Can you now see how it is? Um, can you make sense of it mentally? Yes. So let's say break even. That's when you're talking about like, okay, one unit. Let's say shoes, we sell shoes. Then okay. how would you calculate breaking for something that we sell more? Uh, that all cost different um, uh, labor costs, like the production costs. And how would mm -hmm. you do that? So I want to first make sure that I understand you right. When we're looking at break even, yes, we're looking at one product. Yes. Yeah. One product. But a business might have multiple, but a business might have multiple products. Which you then take by the average of each product. Asking you then take the average of each product, yeah. and let's say shoes, t-shirts, jeans, whatever, and you put that total cost. So mm -hmm. average, mm -hmm. and then you break even, and then one unit. So usually, yeah, what a business wants to do in an ideal world, you want to ensure that every product in and of itself is catering to its own costs. Does that make sense? And that's why we do break even, obviously, per product. Right. Um, but obviously, now as a business, we are obviously by all means trying to avoid that we make a loss. Worst case scenario, let's at least cover our costs, okay, which is why breaking is so important. So, in the real world, we would say, okay, if I know if I sell 10 shoes, then we cover all our expenses. I know if we sell five t shirts, then we cover all our expenses. Okay. Um, usually, you would you would, you would still need to do the break-in based on the, the various products that you're selling, but you obviously make a mental note to say, this is the minimum number of shoes, this is the minimum number of t-shirts, this is the num minimum number of track suits, okay? Then as you're going through the month, you'll say, I've already sold two shoes, okay? Um, so if I want to break even, I just need to sell another three, right? To sell the five shoes. But then, at the same time, you might not manage to strike that, but you're saying, okay, but I have sold so many t-shirts. So the revenue generated, I know that I'm covered. Does it make sense? 
I, I know I'm not answering your question directly, no, but no, typically no. when it comes to break-even analysis, we can't incorporate all the products. Does it make sense? We can't incorporate all the products into that one calculation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because again, if I'm just to go in a bit deeper, you'll find the variable cost for t-shirts, the variable cost for shoes, the variable cost for whatever other products is different. So can you see how it begins to make it a bit messy? It doesn't make sense to do that to just bring the points on the graph. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, again. Hey, <laughs> yeah, it would be crazy. I mean, if we if we were doing a fitness company, for instance, the the cost of a bottle, just a bottle like that, and the cost of shoes and other different apparel will be all over the place. But I'm, I'm sure that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, that's, that's your revision on uh, learning units one to two, at least. Now you've got the formula sheet. So it's now about, you've got that in Word. In each unit that you get in, add in the formulas for those. I, I literally only do it one to three, okay? So you're going to need to do that. And then trust me, if you're practicing ex exercises, now, by the time you get to the test or the exam, you should be good. Um, I explained earlier that I have, I think, six ICE tasks for you guys, but it's based on activities in your textbook. So from an ICE task perspective, and it'll, I'll literally say, this is activity three point whatever. So literally, you just need to do it in your textbook and then upload your answers, and then you should be good. All right? All right. So... Yeah, man, let's, let's, let's get this thing out the way. Let's get this thing out the way. Okay, cool. Uh, that is it.